Hey guys, how's it going? I'm Mel from Mel Did It Herself, and I'm a social service worker turned furniture refinisher, DIYer, small business owner, and content creator. I've learned everything I know about these industries thanks to people who shared their knowledge on the internet, so I'm paying it forward by bringing you my tips, lessons learned, and sharing my journey in this space with you. So thank you so much for being here, being curious, and being a lifelong learner like me. Let's hop into it. What's up, my friends and fellow busy bees? I hope your day is going great so far. Today, I wanted to talk about something that doesn't really have any consensus. It's kind of a guessing game, and it's ever-evolving, and depending on who you talk to about it, you'll likely get a different answer from every person. And that is pricing your painted and refinished furniture pieces. What to charge, how to know, and what to do to make sure you keep up with the ever-changing market. I'm adding a disclaimer here that this knowledge that I pass on to you guys is always just based on my personal experience and my opinion, and a reminder that I'm located in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, so keep that in mind, I guess, because the market where you are could be, and likely is, drastically different, so make sure that you're always doing your own research and figuring out what works best to take into consideration when you're pricing your pieces. And so I know that this is maybe a touchy subject for some because a lot of people don't like to talk money. And I want to challenge that mindset and ask you why that is. Is it because your parents never talked about it? Maybe they told you that it's rude to talk about or unbecoming to talk about? Is it because you feel insecure about the prices that you're setting your pieces at? Or because you just make up numbers randomly out of thin air and don't want people to judge you for it? If you do, you're not alone, don't worry. If any of those things happen to be true, I hope that by the end of this episode, I can give you some things to think about and consider and hopefully help you to reevaluate your stance because I do truly think that the more we talk about these things, the better it is for everyone. And that's not just in relation to the refinished furniture pieces that you're selling, I mean in life more generally personal opinion here, but I do think that it is a dated mindset to think or to say that it's rude or unbecoming to talk numbers and have an open dialogue when it comes to finances. I think that inherently brings shame into the mix, which I don't think it ever needs to be, and it can lead to a severe scarcity mindset, and I think it adds a veil of secrecy to something that is super tangible in a language that we all speak. Like, have you ever been at a job and offered a raise or a bonus or something like that, but it comes along with the request or warning, not sure which it is necessarily, to keep the information to yourself and not discuss it with your coworkers? What's that all about? So people can get away with paying people more money and let those who are more passive and not asking for the pay that they think they deserve to continue to make way less than everyone else because they had some trust that their employer would be equitable and transparent? Anyways, stepping off of my soapbox, but that's all to say, I think everyone benefits when we talk about these things openly and often and are comfortable doing so. So let's do it. So there are definitely a lot of factors that I looked at in order to determine what to price my painted and refinished furniture pieces at. And if you're just starting out and you haven't yet set those numbers or the equation for figuring it out yourself yet. It could potentially sound like a lot of information and work to do in this episode, but I promise that once you start to set that for yourself and you know where you're at, it's easy peasy to adjust and figure out things moving forward once you invest that initial time into researching and just figuring things out. The first thing to take into consideration are the hard numbers, like the price that you initially paid for the piece that you made over, and the cost of materials used to transform the piece. So that's things like any paint, stain, top coat, cleaner, sandpaper, or hardware that you bought for the piece and used on the piece. And of course, there might need to be a little bit of math that goes into that because you may only use a half of the pint of paint that you bought or more convoluted still trying to roughly figure out what percentage of the cleaner that you used from the full bottle and how many uses you could roughly get out of it over time. Personally, I just guesstimate when it comes to those kinds of things and I think it's totally fine to do so. But if you want to figure out a specific, more scientific and accurate way to calculate that, knock yourself out. It will only ever give you more accurate information to take into account when pricing your piece. 
Another thing to take into account, and full disclosure, I am brutal at this, and it's something that I'm currently trying to tackle a system for, for it that works for me, is factoring your time spent on the piece into the price. And really, when we think about that, that should probably encompass the time it took you to secure the piece, pick it up, plus doing the cleaning and prep and transformation, plus staging and photographing it, and then if you offer it, delivery time and gas and mileage all taken into account. So yeah, that's why I'm not great at it yet, because it's a lot of moving parts to keep track of. And since I am quite the busy bee, a lot of these things I'm just doing as I putz away throughout the day, and I'm not typically just sitting down for like five hours straight and dedicating that time exclusively on working on a piece. I'll usually be working on two pieces at a time, at a minimum, if I'm being honest with myself, there's usually anywhere from three to five pieces on the go in some fashion in the garage. So to break it down on how much time I allocated to one certain piece becomes hard to ascertain. However, I will say that now, after having done this for a little over two and a half years, I do have a relatively good idea of how long it will take me to complete a piece. Not really in terms of actual hours and minutes spent, but more of a vibe of how fast I could get it completed if I had to rush it. So I use that knowledge as a guiding light too when I'm pricing my pieces or even providing estimates for projects to my clients that I work with. And then once you have an idea, rough or exact of how long you took or will take to complete said piece, there's the effort of figuring out how much per hour you'll be charging for your time. And that is so broad and ambiguous that I honestly can't even give you any real advice other than just to choose a number that doesn't make you feel like, ugh, this isn't even worth my time. Choose a number that makes you feel good, makes you motivated to do a good job and and finish the job, and ideally one that helps you to pay the bills too. This part is so hard though, I can hear the size already because you hope that I would have some magic formula or answer, but it's just so different person to person. And it's also hard too because you may think that you're worth a certain amount per hour and then factor in all of the materials and the initial cost of the item, then add on the cost per hour times hours worked on the piece, and end up with an astounding number that you're pretty sure nobody is willing to pay for the completed piece in front of you. That's because it can be so easy when doing this work to get super detailed or get bogged down on spending literally hours trying to fix or repair one tiny spot and you might be fighting with it and then realize how much time has gone by. So always consider that not only when you're actually working on the furniture pieces themselves, but also when sourcing your pieces. Because if you look at something and know that you can repair it, but it would take an extra four hours compared to working on a similar piece in better condition, you might not necessarily be able to be compensated for that effort in the same way. But then again, if it makes you fulfilled and brings you joy and makes your heart happy to do it regardless, then you do you, boo-boo. As I always say, this is your business to run however the hell you want. You're in charge here. Another tip to help you nail down some more tangible numbers is to take a look around your area and see what others are charging for refinished and painted furniture, particularly ones who look like they match your level of skill, expertise, and attention to detail. And you'll know it when you see it. Even better is to be able to build relationships with those other refinishers in your area because then you can chat with them to find out where these numbers they're charging came from. And if they just kind of made them up, but you determine that they ought to be higher, you can reset that standard in your area based on the current economy and all the other factors that go into pricing a product or service. And you should also get to know those people so that you can create some friendships and community with them. If you haven't already listened to it, shameless plug to go back after you're done this episode and listen to episode number 10, Community Over Competition, to find out what positive things can come out of that. And I'll leave the link in the show notes below. Another recommendation I have to determine what to price your painted and refinished furniture pieces at is to listen to your customers or potential customers because you might get some hints there in terms of if you're meeting the mark or if your prices are too high or too low. And no, I do not mean to look at the messages that come in on Facebook Marketplace that are like, you're asking how much for a used dresser? That's too expensive for me. What's the lowest you could do? No, I cannot emphasize this point enough and in the kindest way possible, fuck those people. (laughs) 
Do not let the random one-off comments from people on Marketplace get to you or get you to start second-guessing yourself. I mentioned this on the last episode, but those people are not your target audience and the people that understand everything that goes into refinishing a piece of furniture. They think that you lived with and used this piece as is for the last 10 years and are then trying to sell it off for a high price, which is not the case. Know your worth and don't let those messages make you insecure and just know that there is a chance that you will get those messages. So anticipate it and figure out what your reply will be. Maybe even write out a version of it and keep it in your notes app so that you're set when and if it does come in. Because we're human and it's easy to have a knee-jerk reaction when someone offers $50 for the newly refinished and just listed dresser that you posted for $650. It's easy, especially the first time it happens, to be like, what the fuck? (laughs) And maybe even get a bit offended, maybe. But you are a savvy, smart, level-headed business owner with a reputation to uphold. So how are you going to reply? Polite, courteous, and professional, as you always do. But if you don't have a pre-written message and you're feeling a little heated or getting in your feelings about it, just take a beat and put the phone down and go simmer down before you come back calm and level-headed to reply. And it can sound silly and it can feel silly in the moment to react that way initially, but it's because you know how much time and care and energy and maybe even frustration and triumph and whatever else you put into transforming that piece into something that you're proud to release into the world just to have someone undervalue it. It can sting, but it's okay. Water off a duck's back, not the target audience, babe. If it's helpful, my usual reply to those people is... Just something along the lines of, like, thanks so much for the offer. Unfortunately, I can't accept as this is my business. And so there's a lot of factors that I take into account when pricing my pieces to keep good margins. So the price is firm at this time for X amount. Let me know if you're interested or something like that. For some, knowing that it's a business helps them to better understand not only why the pricing is higher than your average person selling off whatever on Marketplace, but also the fact that they'd be getting a better quality item too. Okay, so that was like a bit of a tangent, but I think it's an important one because I always hear people talking about not knowing how to reply to those kinds of comments, or worse yet, I see people post their conversations with people offering low amounts and then they absolutely roast them either online or to them in the conversation and they're like short and rude with them and it just makes me go, yikes, we're better than that, guys. But what I do mean when I say to listen to your clients to figure out if you're hitting the mark with your pricing is to listen to the things that they're saying. If you've heard someone say, wow, this is such a great deal, or I can't believe I got this for this amount or something like that, chances are you're not charging enough. One thing that was a huge wake-up call for me early on in the summer of 2020, which was only a couple months into me having ever done any furniture flips, was when I was working on this little side table or nightstand, I guess, in the garage, and our neighbor was getting some landscaping done, and the contractor doing it was there for a few days, so we chatted here and there for a couple of days as I plugged away in the garage working on my pieces and he ended up asking if I was going to sell that nightstand because he liked the look of it and when I said yeah and he asked for how much I was like uh 40 bucks in my head I'm thinking okay well I got it for free and spent a little bit of time sanding and painting it and used about maybe four dollars in paint on it so that seems like a profit that I'm happy with because this was one of the first pieces I ever sold and I think he literally replied with you sure (laughs) which is hilarious to look back on. And so if you're getting that kind of messaging from your customers, raise your prices, people. But in my mind at that time, I was like, how much would Ikea charge for a nightstand? And I figured being on par with that made sense. I know, I know, I've learned since then, okay? But anyways, so for whatever reason, I was going to be away from the house on the day that the contractor was finishing up at my neighbor's. So I told him that I'd leave the table on the porch for him to grab and just to leave the cash in the mailbox. And when I got home, he had left $50. He literally paid more than asking because he valued at more or maybe felt bad or something. But anyways, I took that as a pretty clear message that I could up my price a bit. So I have incrementally over time, which I recommend you do as well. 
as you fine tune your skills, increase your knowledge of products and techniques and finesse your work, as well as increase your client base and positive reviews and testimonials from others, you can up your prices. All of that expertise is relevant and indicative of the level and quality of finish that you'll be achieving. And it makes sense for you to be compensated for that. It's the same in the trades. People get paid little to nothing when they're doing their apprenticeship, but then as they graduate and move their way up, they get paid more and more because you're paying for that experience and education that they've spent years getting. And if there's anyone in the trades listening and I'm using the wrong words, forgive me, but I'm a social work bitch who hadn't done more than pick up a hammer a couple years ago, so I might not be using the right lingo. (laughs) And so I mentioned looking to IKEA pricing to figure out pricing for things. And while I don't necessarily recommend looking there, because I do absolutely think that the quality of your pieces and their individual design are likely worth more than the pricing IKEA can offer, I do think looking at furniture retailers is helpful. It can provide a bit of a starting point to get an idea of how much people are paying for new furniture pieces, especially if you haven't had to purchase one lately and don't know off the top of your head how much a double headboard or something like that goes for these days. It's also helpful to keep an eye on those prices periodically too, because especially lately, I bet you'd notice that they've risen with inflation and all the other things going on in the world. Have you also increased your prices to reflect inflation and keep up with the competitors? Or has your pricing remained the same since 2014? Just some food for thought. Another thing to consider, and I know I've heard other refinishers talk about this, is the fact that you can take into account the material that's being used or that your piece is created from. And while I don't recommend putting your price any lower if it's a lower quality quote unquote material like MDF or something like that, don't just sell it for so cheap just because. Make sure that you're upholding the standard of the community that you're in and how much pieces go for because that does start to undervalue the whole kind of industry and business of it. But I do know that some people If they, for example, have a solid wood piece or they know, for example, that it's um, an antique or a highly vintage piece because of some of the characteristics on it and things like that, they'll sell it for a bit more because of that and because it's something that people tend to value more. So keep that in your mind as well as you are pricing your pieces that typically solid wood items can have a bit of a higher level price tag, if you will. And ultimately, when it gets down to it, You also can just put a number that you think the piece is worth, and no matter how high that number is, it might sell. It also can mean that it sits for a long time first, though, so make sure that you have the space to hold on to it if that's the case. It also could sit for years and not sell at that price, too. It truly depends, but I am of the belief that as long as it's relatively reasonably priced, there is a buyer for every piece of furniture you make over. So don't second guess yourself or lose confidence in your work if you post something and it doesn't get scooped up within the first couple hours. Sometimes that happens, but often it doesn't. It usually has more to do with the ebb and flow of the market and how many people are looking for what items and when, and nothing to do with your work or the price that you listed it at. So sit tight and try and not think about it too much, and I can almost guarantee that a buyer will be coming your way in no time, my friend. After having done this for a few years now, I've definitely noticed within the calendar year that there's times when people typically are buying more or my pieces are selling more. The summer, like August specifically, things have been a little bit quieter. I think people are, you know, the kids are out of school and everyone's going on their vacation before kids go back to school. So people aren't really A, sitting on marketplace or B, you know, changing things around in their house. A lot of the time earlier in the year, I get a lot of action. So people are busy during the holidays, but then that week after Christmas, before New Year's, people are sitting around, looking around. And it's kind of surprising because you would think that people are maybe trying to hold back on spending at that time because Christmas just went by and presumably they spent a lot of money. But I found that in January, 
February-ish is often when it gets pretty busy in my area at least. A lot of people tend to be spending more time inside because it's cold as fuck out and probably looking around and deciding to switch things up and getting a little stir crazy so trying to bring new things into their environment. So just take those things into account too that that has nothing to do with you. It's just the market and as you can start to see those patterns over time you can have your pieces reflected. Make sure that you have more inventory available at those times because you know that there could and will probably be an influx. So take all that into account. And now I said I was going to talk numbers and I didn't really. So that was a little bit of a cop out, I guess. But truly, I have seen pieces listed for, you know, as low as maybe $300 and also pieces that go for well over $1,000. And Both of those things are sold. Both of them are beautiful. And so if you're sitting at the lower end of the bracket in your area, take a look around at other refinishers, see what they're doing, and just start incrementally raising your prices and see if that gives you the confidence to go in a little bit harder, have some more confidence in setting the price higher, and I guarantee with that will come time and expertise in your craft, and people will be willing to pay that. The right people, again, I will point out. The right people will be willing to. And as you start to do that, you're going to be growing your client base as well. And so always make sure when people are buying pieces from you that you're, again, having that good client service and hopefully they'll turn into repeat customers. Another thing that I like to do when it comes with pricing is if I'm going to be working with someone, if somebody, you know, buys multiple pieces from me or I do multiple custom projects for them. I do like to give them a bit of a discount for those repeated pieces as we move forward because A, I think it keeps them coming back to me and keeps them happy, presumably, that they're getting a better deal. I don't actually necessarily always tell them that I've given them a discount, but it's reflected in my pricing, so I hope that they're happy with that, I guess. (laughs) But there's those little things that you can do that will maybe mean that you're getting a little bit less in the short term, but in the long term, it will bring you much more work, much happier customers, and overall will help your business to grow. But again, we're not selling ourselves short and we're not making ourselves work for nothing. So make sure that you're factoring all of those things that I talked about earlier into the equation and go get paid, baby. And something that you may not know about me I love little motivational messages. They literally always get me fired up and I keep a running list of ones that are especially catchy or speak to me in the notes app on my phone. So I'm going to end every podcast episode with one of these that I've noted down over the years in hopes that you leave our time here each week feeling inspired, motivated, and ready to take on whatever comes your way this week. So this week's Mel's motivational message is actually a quote from Jen, who was featured in episode 10 of the podcast from pre Love to Be Loved. She said this one time in our group chat, and I thought it was A, hilarious, and B, a good thing to remember. And I think it applies as we're talking about pricing and not selling ourselves short. She said, and I'm assuming it came from somewhere, but I haven't looked up where Bees don't waste their time explaining to flies that honey is better than shit. It's so true. When we're talking about those people who are coming in and trying to get us to take less money for the hard work that we do, don't waste your time explaining. I mean, reply to them. Like I said, you know, have that dialogue. But if they're adamant of not seeing the value in the work that you're doing and they're, you know, really trying to get a deal out of it... You know, sometimes they come back with a bit of a sob story and all those things are maybe true and that's unfortunate. But like they say, just because you're out of their budget doesn't mean that you're overpriced. And if we also take this to a wider perspective, bees don't waste their time explaining to flies that honey is better than shit. Let's take a gander in our own lives. Are there times, are there people that you're spending a lot of time and energy and emotion and maybe frustration trying to get a point across that you feel in the depths of your heart is the right perspective, the right opinion to have and, you know, you're getting fired up or spending all of your time when you're with this person, quote unquote, debating about this thing? Bees don't waste their time explaining to flies that honey is better than shit. Just leave it. Again, we're all about living our lives, staying positive, having a good mindset. 
And at the end of the day, does that thing really matter? Is that the hill that you want to die on? I'm guessing probably not. So remember that as you go into this week and beyond. Anyways, guys, that's where I'm going to leave it for today. If you have been enjoying the podcast so far and you have not yet done so, please, please, please head over to the platform that you are listening on today and leave it a rating, preferably five stars, but you do you. And if you have the ability to do so, if you're on Apple Podcasts, if you could leave a review and tell everyone why you love the podcast, why you tune in week after week, and the value that you get out of it, that will really, really help us to grow and have more people join us on this furniture refinishing ride. All right, that's it. I appreciate your time and I'll catch you guys next week.